Welcome back to my channel for a very special episode. And this episode is about Fuji APS-C cameras. And I have here the Fuji X-H2, which is kind of a new camera, and then the even newer camera, Fuji X-T5. Both cameras have a crop sensor, so let's open this up here. Let's have a look. So it's a much smaller sensor than what you typically see on my channel because I'm mainly shooting full frame format or medium format cameras. And my general belief over many years was that if you are a pro photographer and you want to go for a pro shooting, you need a full frame sensor or you need a medium format sensor if you want to go beyond full frame. But these two new Fuji X cameras really changed my mind because they provide pro quality and the pro shooting experience. And they also finally, and I think they're the first ones who offer this, offer a reasonable resolution of 40 megapixel compared to the usual 24 megapixel. Now you can safely argue and say 24 megapixel is plenty enough. And I had this discussion on recent videos which I posted about the Leica SL2S. But you know, some people like to have these resolution reserves and that did hold them back for shooting APS-C cameras. Here now we have 40 megapixel on both sensors. I'll go into details in the course of the video. I also have some of the best Fujinon lenses you can shoot on these two cameras. I will provide sample images. I will also provide a side-by-side -side comparison in detail of these two new Fuji X cameras. Let's kick off the video. Looking at the two cameras, first of all here the X-H2 and then here the X-2.5. The difference between the cameras is that the X-T5 is more designed in the typical Fuji retro design, which also reminds me in good old times of film roll photography. Whereas this one here has a clear pro design and I will come to more differences in a moment. And as I said, we'll also look into the specifications side by side so you see the differences between these two camera bodies. A camera system always is only as good as the lenses provided to it. And I have here in front of me five of, in my opinion, the best lenses you can have on Fuji X cameras. We have a 23 millimeter lens and uh, we have the famous 56 millimeter lens. And I show sample images with both of these lenses. We also have here for sports and action and you know, also for macro type shootings, a 100 to 400 millimeter lens, which is a huge and very heavy lens and is actually in the same category in terms of dimensions of what you would purchase for a full frame or medium format camera. And then we have here, a very interesting lens, which is a 50 millimeter lens and has a widest open aperture of F1. And I was fascinated by that lens. I think that is the lens I shot most on a weekend with these two cameras. And then we have here a zoom lens, which is the 16 to 55 millimeter lens. And it's also a fantastic lens and gives you a lot of versatility in your shooting. Now, when we want to compare these type of lenses in an APS-C sensor setup, with full frame equivalent setup, we need to calculate the crop factor and need to translate the focal length as well as the aperture. And uh, let's take for instance, the 50 millimeter lens here. So this is a 50 millimeter lens widest open F 1.0. Let's just get this disassembled here. So you see it. So here it's the Fujinon aspherical lens, which means has high optical qualities. And then if we turn this by 180 degrees, we get here the specifications. It's a super EBC XF lens, 50 millimeter widest open F 1.0. It's also weather resistant and it has a filter thread of 77 millimeter. And if you want to translate this into a full frame setup, I'm just doing this once and then I leave it up to you is 50 millimeter corresponds applying a crop factor of 1.5 to 75 millimeter focal length in the full frame equivalent setup and the widest open aperture. By the way, listen to these aperture clicks. This is a Leica type feeling here. Beautiful. A widest open aperture of f1.0 translates with a crop factor of 1.5 to a widest open aperture of f1.5 in a full frame equivalent setup. Having one of these lenses, like here, the 50 millimeter f1.0 in my hands, it has significant weight. And uh, there is a lot of glass inside and the image quality, I did shoot portraits with that lens is absolutely stunning. And the build quality of these lenses also is beyond any doubt. The focus ring is buttery smooth. The aperture ring has the clicks I just showed and we have weather resistance and these lenses can be shut on weather sealed bodies. 
under all weather conditions outside. So quite nice. It's a really fascinating system. What we have here and also on the zoom lenses. So here we have a standard zoom 16 to 55 millimeter. We have widest open f 2.8. Again, listen to the aperture ring here. Beautiful, smooth, but with sufficient resistance and a very good zoom ring here. Quite nice how this goes in and out. And then of course here a very smooth and uh, nevertheless with some resistance focus ring if you go in a manual focusing situation. So quite nice and I should say I enjoyed a lot shooting these Fuji XF lenses on for instance the Fuji X-H2. Let's now mount one of these lenses on the X-H2 and let's see how this looks like. So let's take the 16 to 55 widest open f 2.8 lens. Let's mount it. There's a red dot which we need to align straight forward and then it snaps in. And also here if you mount it on the mount, listen to that click. Very solid and there is absolutely no play here. You cannot accidentally turn these lenses. They sit really firmly on the camera body and as I said, the build quality of this camera system is absolutely fascinating. Let's also mount the lens on the X-T5 and the lens I want to mount here is actually the 23 millimeter lens here, which has a widest open aperture of f1.4, which then creates a very interesting system for street photography. Again, aligning the red dot, same solid, firmly sitting lens on the mount, no play here, really well built. And now we have this camera here, which has almost the same features as this one, but some differences I'm going to point out. And it looks beautiful. It's a beautiful camera lens combination if you look at that. And uh, since it's weather sealed, it's also very robust. Now, my first impression when I got the Fuji X-H2 over a weekend is I have seen this camera before because it looks like the little sister or little brother of the Fuji GFX 100S, which is here. Of course, a much bigger camera if you have a look, but the elements, the display we have on top of here where the shutter button is sitting, you know, the controls here, if you look at that, there are lots of similarities to this medium format camera, the Fuji GFX 100S. And the shooting experience is also very similar, although we have a huge difference between the sensor we have here in the GFX 100S, of course, and an APS-C crop sensor like in the H2. But the similarities are absolutely eye-catching. These camera bodies look pretty much the same with minor differences. And that's why I also believe that this is probably the more pro camera, not only from the specifications as we will see in a moment when I do the side by side comparison with the Fuji X-T5, but also from a design perspective, this is probably the better tool for pro photographers who need a workhorse delivering under all circumstances with a very good and solid grip. Look at the grip here. This is very solid and goes very deep to the camera body. Whereas here, the grip is not as accentuated if you compare that. Let me try to show this here. So here you have, I think, a much better grip. You also have the top display with essential information, which helps you. And it also will provide a nice segue if you shoot for some years with these type of cameras and then you want to migrate and upgrade yourself to a GFX camera into the medium format system. The shooting experience will be very similar and you have a lot of elements learned to operate on this camera body, which you then will need to operate on a Fuji GFX 100S, for instance. Now, what of these two camera bodies you like most, of course, is not only a question of application. As I said, the grip here is much better in my opinion and the top display pays back when you have a shooting. It's also, of course, a matter of taste. And here everyone is the master of her or his own agenda. And a lot of people will argue and say, and I know the fan community speak on these type of cameras, the X-T5, which has a long tradition going back to the X-T4, the X-T3 and so on, is the more beautiful camera. And I tend to agree with that because that retro design with more control wheels on top here, if we compare that, here we only have a mold dial and also for custom settings, whereas here, we have dedicated control wheels for ISO, for shutter speed and for exposure compensation. That is a design a lot of classical photographers will appreciate. And it's also a bit more compact in terms of dimensions here on the Fuji X-T5 than what you have on the H2, as we'll see also later in the spec sheet. So there are really good arguments shooting these beautiful lenses on an X-T5 body. And there are also very good arguments shooting these lenses on an X-H2 body. And as I said, it's a matter of taste and what you prefer in terms of shooting experience and design.
If you want to distinguish these two cameras by image quality, you are in bad luck situation because the image quality on still images on both cameras will be exactly the same. That's why I'm also showing later sample images shot with the H2 and whatever lens I mounted on my H2 body, if I would have mounted it on the T5, the outcome would have been exactly the same. There's absolutely no difference. So in terms of image quality, you don't get some criteria for distinguishing these two cameras. It's really only the design, the shooting experience, but on some specifications, the H2 camera has an advantage, as we'll see in a moment. Fuji shooters who want to migrate to the T5 or the H2 will be familiar with the camera in no time because the menu structure is the usual menu structure you have on Fuji cameras and is also very similar to what you have on the GFX system in the medium format cam. And uh, we have here image quality. We can go here for all kinds of effects on filters and settings, which only affect JPEG images and do not touch the raw image. You have a feature pack camera here. And uh, for instance, if you go here into the drive button, then we can see here, we have still images, we have burst mode, we have here bracketing for ISO, white balance bracketing, we have exposure bracketing, uh, we have HDR, we have panorama, we have multi exposures, which we can take. And we have the famous pixel shift multi shot, which you also have on the GFX 100S which takes you on the medium format camera system, for instance, up from 100 megapixel to 400 megapixel. So there are lots of features here in that camera, which you can play with and detect. You also have, if we go here back into the menu and go to the camera menu and we scroll down a little bit, you also have here interval timer shooting. So there are lots of features you can use and the menu and features I just showed on the H2 replicate themselves on the T5. Let's just switch this camera on so you can see this. And if we go here into the menu, for instance, you see this is exactly the same structure, the same way to operate it. No difference at all. If we go, for instance, in the camera menu here, we find here the interval timer shooting setting. By the way, we also have on both cameras the famous Q button, which always sits on Fuji cameras. So if I push that, I get into an overview matrix with lots of settings. I can navigate here with my joystick and then I can change the settings here in the way I want to change them. And uh, that is something which Fuji shooters always appreciate. It's the same, of course, on the H2. Here we have here the Q button and exactly the same setup. There are differences in the way you operate the camera because on that retro type camera, you have more control wheels here. So for instance, when we had on the H2 before here, the drive button, which took us into controlling the drive mode here, where we also have at the very bottom, the multi shot, that sits on control wheels on the X-T5, which I think a lot of classical Fuji shooters will appreciate. So it's here on that control ring here. And you see, I can turn this and then we have here, let's have a look here. Let's bring this a bit closer. So here we have HDR, you know, here we have all these settings, bracketing, panorama. It's all on this control wheel. And there is a little lever here, which you can use to turn this. And uh, that, of course, might for some people a more convenient way of operating the camera. You also have a sub control wheel here, and that is about still shooting and movie shooting, which then switches the camera into video mode. And that's quite nice. And, uh, you know, I repeat myself, but design and the way you operate these cameras, there are clearly differences. And if you compare these two, that, in my opinion, is the more pro one. That here is the more beautiful one and has more classical control wheels. If you are not so much into buttons and displays, then you should go for this camera because that will make you much more happy. Both cameras have a lot of elements to control your workflow and they can also be customized, which I typically do at the beginning when I take a camera out of the box. Let's quickly show that just as an illustrative example here. So if I go down here to the settings menu, then I have here, sorry, that was one notch too far. Then we have here button dial settings. And uh, if I go into that, for instance, function buttons, I get an illustration of the camera and see exactly what I can do here to customize the button or also the control wheels. And we have exactly the same on the H2. If we go here in the menu and uh, we go to the settings and then in the settings, we have button dial settings and then we have exactly the same. Here we can have the same illustration we had before with a different camera body, of course. And then if you wanna change it, you just push the button and then you can select whatever you wanna have. Both cameras also have a very solid mechanical shutter and also a very fast electronic shutter. And uh, that's probably the fastest electronic shutter I've seen. Having said that, 
Fuji warns in the manual that you should not overdo it with electronic shutter because there might be rolling shutter effects if you have fast moving objects in your scene. What I want to do now is I want to show some sample images which I've taken with the X-H2 and these five lenses I showed before. And then I want to go into a detailed but very quick comparison of the specifications between these two cameras. You already saw the differences in design. You saw the differences in the way you operate the camera. Here you have more control wheels. Here you have more the pro design of the medium format Fuji GFX system. You have a better hand grip here on the H2 than what you have on the T5. But that will not hold people back who love this design to purchase this camera. And uh, what is of course now very interesting is to see in terms of specifications, video and what have you, where are the differences and what do you purchase if you go for this one or for this one. When I show these sample images now, they are shot on the X-H2, but as I mentioned before, they would be in exactly the same quality and outcome if I would have mounted the corresponding lens on the T5 because the image quality on stills is exactly the same. What I also want to mention, I want to go into details on a few of these images. Both cameras have an excellent focus tracking system, which we'll see in a moment in the specifications. And I used it to track some objects. I was playing, as I said, over a weekend with five lenses and the X-H2 and focus tracking works very well on these cameras. So we'll also have a quick look into that. I want to comment on a few of these images and also on some images I've not shown in the slideshow before. So first of all, here's a shot with the XF16-55. to It's shot widest open at f2.8, one of 400 seconds and an ISO of 800. And I also cropped in a little bit. So the resolution as Lightroom is showing here is 33.6 megapixel and not the full 40 megapixel. If I crop in here by 100%, this is absolutely brilliant. It's absolutely sharp, crisp. The colors are nice, the background is super blurry, and it looks really good. So this was shot at a focal length of 55 millimeter. Here an image shot at f8.0 with a 16 to 55 lens and an ISO of 10,000. So a really high ISO and this image still looks good. And I think in general the low light sensitivity of these two sensors, we come to the spec after we looked into the images, is really impressive. Here is another image. You can read everything on these bottles here. So they are ginger shots here. And the same applies to the next one, which is also shot at an ISO of 10,000. And you can read everything here. There is not a lot of noise in the image. In the dark areas, you see some noise. But for an ISO 10,000 image, this is actually quite impressive. Staying with the 16 to 55 lens, here are images at different focal lengths. So this is wide angle, then we go more and more into the tele area and I think in general these images are really sharp. The colors from the fall season come across very well. Let's crop in by 100%. You see all the details here. It's shot at an ISO of 800 and 1 over 250 seconds and the aperture was stopped down to an f8. But this looks really good and you see a lot of details in these images and in general I think a very fair reflection of the scene in front of the camera. Switching now the lens and going to the XF 56mm f1.2. That is a brilliant lens for people photography. You see here nicely the soft background, the blurriness. You see my subject in the foreground is very sharp, 
Very crisp, you see all the details. This is an almost 40 megapixel image, 39.8, I only cropped in a tiny little bit. And this is a brilliant lens, of course. It's also the newest iteration of that lens. There exist former versions of this lens. And this is ideal for people photography, fashion, beauty, what have you. You can also use it for compressed landscape, of course. But here I think is the ideal application of that fantastic lens. The XF 56 millimeter is built to be shut widest open. And here's another image. Again, look how soft and nice the background blurriness is and how sharp my subject is here in the foreground. Very nice how the texture of the skin comes across the eyelashes, the lips and the texture of the lips. Very, very nice. And I did actually shoot most of these lenses most of the time widest open and never regret it. You will stop down, of course, for landscape or, you know, cityscapes like we saw before. But on people, it's just perfect to shoot them widest open. Switching lenses going to the XF 50mm, which I showed before in the video, with a widest open aperture of f1.0. And as I mentioned, in a full frame equivalent setup, this would be a 75mm lens with widest open f1.5. And this is probably my most favorite lens on the Fuji X system, because it is so nice in terms of how it renders the background and how it separates the foreground from the background and how sharp everything is you see in that lens, even when it is shut widest open. Very nice. And uh, here are a few more images. Let's crop in here by 100%. Look at the details you get. Widest open shut at f1.0, ISO of 125. But also from a distance it performs because if I crop in here, you see that if you crop then to 100%, the subject in the foreground is still nicely separated from the background, even if you shoot that lens at f2.8. Very nice lens, very heavy glass, but it fully pays back to have this lens mounted on the H2 or the T5. In terms of autofocus performance, both cameras have face detection, eye detection, so it's ideal also for tracking. I come to tracking a bit later in the video. And it also has subject recognition, so it can recognize cars, trains, planes, you know, animals, what have you. And you see here again how reliable that autofocus system is working in the H2. The eye is pinpoint sharp, we have a nice background blurriness and in general autofocus was super reliable on the camera and is as well reliable on the Fuji X-T5. Many of the Fuji XF lenses are also good for close-up shots, although they are not really macro lenses. And here again is the XF 50mm f1.0. Here is where the focus was sitting. You see all the structure and the details, but you have a very soft background blurriness. And by the way, here in this area, nice circular background bokeh lights, which I like a lot. It looks really pleasant. Here another example with the XF 50mm and you see how circular these background bokeh lights appear here. This is shut again widest open. Here an image I took with the 23mm lens. You don't see metadata here because I was composing two frames here. One frame for the sky and for the Milky Way and the stars in the background and one frame for the foreground. And if you look into that here, this is now clearly a low light example. It looks really nice. You see a lot of detail and the stars are also beautifully rendered here in that Milky Way picture, which I took at a lake in Switzerland where we don't have a lot of light pollution. So the 23 millimeter, which has a full frame equivalent focal length of 35 millimeter, is an ideal lens for landscape, you know, reportage, architecture, but in particular also for the night sky and the sensors of the H2 and the T5 they are in particular nicely catching light if you want to go for a Milky Way picture like I did here for that photo. Here now an image shot with the telezoom 100 to 400 millimeter f4.5 to 5.6. And uh, the weekend when I tested the camera system was a hazy, almost foggy weekend with a lot of wind. But you see here nicely the different layers of the mountains, although it's hazy. And uh, I think in particular for what people call compressed landscape, where you have a compression effect from telelenses. This lens is even good for landscape, but of course in particular for sports and action. And uh, that was also the lens I was using for testing the focus tracking on the X-H2. As I said a moment ago, the day was not only a hazy day here in this region in Switzerland, it was also super windy, very strong wind. So I found these two people here setting up their kites for letting them fly. And you see here how they get prepared, how they set this all up. And I was configuring the camera for fast tracking on subjects 
with the autofocus system. And uh, the autofocus system, as I said before, is exactly the same on the T5 as it is on the H2. And actually my focus was super sticky. Also the kites being driven by a very strong wind were super fast, so with super high speed in the air, I never lost focus. And these shots are all sharp. If you have a look here, they all look good and it was absolutely no problem here, for instance, at 400 millimeter with my 100 to 400 millimeter lens on the H2 to follow the kite when it was flying with high speed through the air. So focus tracking, in my opinion, really works. This camera with appropriate lenses is really good for sports and action photography. Taking photos of animals here, a small dog works very well with the 100 to 400 millimeter lens. It's super sharp, it's super crisp, and I like the outcome. It's also, by the way, good for close-ups. If you look here, this is absolutely pinpoint sharp and crisp, but it then has a very nice transition into a background blurriness. So here is the focus sitting and then it transitions and becomes very blurry in the background. This is by the way, a shot with ISO of 800 F5.6 at 400 millimeters. So in the maximum telezoom here and shot at one over 250 seconds, a tiny little crop, 39.8 megapixels or so almost a full 40 megapixel. Looks really nice, sharpness is really impressive. All of the five lenses I shot on the X-H2 are super sharp. Here another sample image which I wanted to quickly show. Look how sharp that is, look how nice the foreground is separated from the background. Same way here, very nice, a lot of detail on this plant or flower here and also here which I just intentionally took as an image to show you how this is resolving here the details on the different aspects of this image. Look at that leaf here, very, very nice. This is the last image with someone who cycles here on a bike and again has this nice telecompression effect which you get if you take landscape pictures with a telezoom or a telelens. All in, it's a fantastic experience shooting these five lenses on the X-H2. As I said, the image quality on the T5 will be exactly the same because it's essentially the same camera if it comes to still images. And what I wanna do now is quickly go through the similarities, but most importantly, the differences between the T5 and between the H2. First of all, the price difference is $300. So I just looked this up at B&H in the US, $1,999 for the H2 and $1,699 for the T5. Then I went to the Fuji website and basically put the camera side by side. So in everything that's coming, you will see on the left hand side the H2 and on the right hand side the T5. And on the first page of specifications, the only difference we can spot here concerns the memory card slots. Whereas on the T5, on the right hand side, we have two SD card slots. We have on the left hand side on the H2, one SD card slot and one slot for Compact Flash Express Type B cards. And that is of course essential for the H2 because as we will see later, the video capabilities on the H2 go beyond of what the T5 is capable and you know, Compact Flash Express Type B cards just have higher transfer rates than what you can achieve on an SD card. On the second page of specifications, the only difference concerns the shutter speed in program mode, which I'm personally not using anyway. I shoot either in fully manual mode or in aperture priority or in shutter priority, but not in program mode. But in program mode on the H2 on the left hand side, you're limited to longer exposures up to four seconds. Whereas on the T5 on the right hand side, you can go up to 30 seconds. On the next page of specifications, the big difference comes in video mode because in videography on the left hand side, the H2, can shoot up to 8K and it actually works very well and the camera also does not get super hot. So if you shoot it, it's a reliable camera for 8K videography. On the right hand side on the T5, you can only, but only is in quote unquote, go up to 6K and uh, actually to be precise, it's 6.2K and that is of course a lower resolution on the T5 than what you can shoot on the H2. For me, that doesn't make a big difference, but it's something to note if you are a pro videographer. And by the way, if you would run into a heat issue shooting 8K with the X-H2, there is an accessory you can purchase from Fuji which is a fan you can mount on the backside of the camera and that will further cool down the camera so you have a longer shooting experience. And then is on that page another difference which really makes a difference for sports and action, namely on the X-H2, you have a much larger buffer for continuous shooting. So you can shoot much more frames in the same time window than what you can shoot on the X-T5. And that is a big advantage, in particular if you focus track on continuous shooting in sports and action subjects and you want to shoot in burst mode. 
On the next page of specifications, everything on both cameras is exactly the same. But differences we then find when we further scroll on the electronic viewfinder as well as on the LCD screen. And on the viewfinder, they both have OLED color viewfinders, but the resolution on the left hand side on the H2 is significantly higher with approximately 5.76 million dots, whereas the T5 has only 3.69 million dots. Now, both viewfinders, in my opinion, are excellent. So this is probably not a distinction criteria here, but it might make a difference for some people. They, by the way, both have a magnification of 0.8 times if you shoot them with a 50 millimeter lens. And on the LCD monitor, it actually flips to the reverse side. The LCD monitor is better on the T5 with 1.84 million dots and on the H2, you only have 1.62 million dots. Having said that, the size of the two screens is exactly the same with 3.0 inch, but the flexibility you have in the way you operate these LCD monitors is different on the two cameras. So on the T5, you can basically pull it out and then you can adjust the angle. For instance, if you want to shoot lower at the ground, you can adjust it in the angle that it suits you, but there is no way to flip it. Whereas here, you really can flip on the H2, the screen out. So this would, for instance, be a protection mode where the LCD screen is protected from scratches. You can get it out, you can rotate it, you can flip it back. Then you have it in the same design as on the T5, but you can also use it in selfie mode if you want to monitor yourself when you shoot yourself, for instance, for a reportage or for a vlog. So here you have much more flexibility on the H2 than what you have on the LCD monitor on the T5. And then last but not least on that page, we only have a top side LCD monitor on the H2 in the same way as we have it on the medium format GFX100S, but we don't have it on the T5. And whether you need or don't need what Fuji calls this sub LCD monitor, of course is completely up to you. Scrolling further down on Fuji's website, we find again video information. So 8K versus 6.2K, we already discussed, but you also have more pro codecs for video shooting on the H2 than what you have on the T5. So for instance, Apple ProRes is available only on the H2 and not on the T5, but the T5 nevertheless is, I would say a good video camera if you wanna use it for that. Scrolling further down, no real differences, but then I found under self timer, a tiny little difference. So on the H2 on the left hand side, you can program the self timer for 10 seconds and two seconds. Whereas on the T5 for still images, same story, 10 seconds and two seconds, but for movie, you have a bit more here of 10 seconds, five seconds, which you don't have on still images and three seconds. And that is the difference between the T5 where you have a bit more granularity on your options than what you have on the H2. Going further down on the website, we find also a tiny little differences on the terminal. And both cameras have a connector for microphone and a remote release connector, a hot shoe and a synchronized terminal but only on the H2 on the left hand side, you have a dedicated headphone slot. And that's what you don't have on the T5, but the T5 provides in the box a headphone adapter. And whether you need a microphone and a headphone slot really depends on what you want to do with the camera. Pro videographers, of course, appreciate to have both on the camera body and not to have to decide and then for a headphone, for instance, use an adapter. I scroll now to the end of the specifications website and can conclude here the last differences we find. First of all, battery life is better on the right hand side on the X-T5 than what you have on the H2. And of course, in videography, for instance, that's also coming from the fact that you have a bit more capabilities on the H2. The dimensions are also bigger on the H2 and you have this option to mount this accessory fan, which helps you to cool down the camera. And then on the accessory side, you also find more accessories in the box of the H2 with one difference. The headphone adapter is only in the T5 box, but that you don't need on the H2 because you have a dedicated headphone jack. I want now to conclude the video and provide a quick wrap up. And I wanna first focus on photography. If you talk about still images, both cameras are exactly the same. The image quality is indistinguishable. It's the same sensor. And if you mount a lens from the H2 on the T5, you will get exactly the same outcome. So here is no difference, except if you are in sports and action photography and you do a lot of burst mode shooting in continuous shooting, then the H2 is way of superior because the buffer for storing frames is much, much larger than what you have on the T5. 
On the videography side, also the H2 has more to offer because you can record up to 8K. You also have the much better storage option here with your compact flash express type B card and the SD card as a backup. Whereas here, as I said in the specifications, you have two SD cards and uh, that of course is on the H2, the more pro setup. But in general, if you can live with 6.2K videography, and if you don't care about that large buffer for continuous shooting, then these cameras are pretty much comparable. Now, the last distinction factor, of course, is design. And I personally think that the H2 has a more pro appearance. It's like a mini copy of the GFX100S in terms of design. And I just like the hand grip here, this deep hand grip, much better than what I have on the T5. Having said that, whenever I look at the T5, I fall in love with the retro design and the nice way to operate these control wheels, where you even have here the sub layers where you can then choose different options. And I think from a beauty design perspective, this clearly is the more beautiful camera. So at the very end, it's up to you what you like. It's a little bit about functions. Here you get more features. This is also the camera which will never get hot or overheated if you shoot video because you can mount here on these two screw holes here, the fan I showed before in the specifications. But you know, if you don't care about that, if you don't need that large buffer for continuous shooting, then the T5 is worthwhile. The same recommendation as the H2. If you like this video, don't forget to drop me a thumbs up. Stay tuned on my channel. There is always more to come. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and healthy. And of course, peace out.